Welcome to Neutral Index Strategies Iron Condors. My name is Sean Howell and I'll be your host. Thanks for joining us. Let's get started. The goal for this video is for you to learn an option strategy that moves away from directional price change predictions. Instead, we'll be focusing on using index options price ranges to build trades that benefit from the passage of time and changes in volatility. Before we can get into neutral index strategies, it's important that first we define what is a neutral market. Well, a neutral market has no clearly identifiable trend over a defined time frame. This indicates that neither buyers nor sellers have control of the market at the present time. A trader can apply a strategy that benefits if this situation continues. And that's really the challenge right there is to determine how long is the situation going to continue. Second bullet point. A neutral market can also be identified by clear points of resistance, that's the inability to move to higher price points, and support, the inability to move to lower price points. Now, when we look at a chart, basically, when we look at resistance, we're kind of considering that to be a ceiling. And where we find a floor, we're going to generally call that, from a technical analysis uh, uh, linguistics, we're going to call that a support point. Third bullet point, neutral price market action can often move quickly between levels of support and resistance. This price behavior may sustain higher options premiums. So if we're at the floor, generally what we're thinking is that it's going to uh, it's going to bounce off that floor and head back up to the ceiling. And the time that it takes uh, to, to make that upward move is usually pretty quick. Uh, in this period of time, we generally see large green candles and large red candles as we kind of bounce back and forth between uh, between the floor support and between resistance. Now we can get into talking about some strategies. There are a number of neutral index strategies, uh, just to go ahead and, and list a few of them. Things like a covered call, a buy right, certain types of cash secured puts, various spread trades, iron butterflies, diagonal spreads, iron condors. These are all strategies that are either well suited for neutral markets or they can be adjusted uh, for neutral markets. So let's go ahead and, and dive into a couple, couple of bullet points about neutral market option strategy. Uh, it's an option strategy that is built around a price range. It does not depend on a directional move to profit. If you think about just buying a call, it doesn't matter if you buy in the money, at the money, or out the money, the underlying will need to move higher in order for you to achieve a profit uh, at expiration. And with a put, if you buy a put, if you're long a put, it will need to move lower uh, in order for you to achieve a profit by expiration. So looking at neutral, it's not dependent on uh, on a directional move. Um, a directional move with a neutral strategy may enhance the profit, but it is not dependent upon it. Second bullet point, a neutral market option strategy generally relies on time decay and or a contraction in volatility to achieve profitability. The trade I'm going to be talking about is going to be an iron condor, and this one definitely is going to depend primarily on, on a contraction in volatility and time decay for its profit. Um, it moving up or down is, is less relevant to the profitability, although it will factor in. Third bullet point, a neutral market option strategy typically has a greater dollar risk versus dollar reward ratio as a trade-off to a higher probability of achieving profit. So as you'll see, we can set up a trade that may have like an 80% probability of generating a profit. And that profit may be, keep everything simple, it may be one buck, uh, but the loss potential may be $3. So generally, investors look at that, okay, I can lose three, but I can only make one. Uh, that That's not very attractive. Usually people are all about losing one and making three, but there's always going to be a trade-off. And that trade-off, and we'll get into that, is going to be the probability of uh, success or the probability of failure and how that plays into everything. Since this is a video on neutral index strategies, let's get started by taking a look at an index. And here we're looking at the S&P 500 six month daily chart from February 10th of 2022. And as you'll see at the current price level, we're at 44, about 44.87. Um, for a couple of periods here, if you look at the candles, we're really just sort of vacillating back and forth between a, between a ceiling and a floor. And here's where I'm seeing the short term ceiling and floor. I'm seeing the short term support and I'm seeing the short term resistance. Um, but there's a second 
layer of support and resistance and and i'm seeing it right at this level um now as far as support goes i'm seeing it down there at about 4300 and i'm seeing resistance just above 4700 there that's that's resistance number one there is a second level of resistance that's even that's even higher up that's at about the 4800 level but there is not a second level of support so as far as thinking about a non-directional strategy, a neutral strategy, uh, really I could focus on either that short-term support and resistance or the longer term. And that's what we're going to take a look at is how to build a trade around that short-term support and resistance level. Earlier, I referenced a couple of neutral option strategies. Uh, in this case, we're going to talk about one that's my favorite, which is the credit iron condor for a neutral market. Let's get into that. First of all, uh, a credit iron condor is delta neutral. And what that really means is that it's it's a non-directional strategy. Um, it's also defined risk, which means that I'm not naked. My loss potential is not unlimited. It is known. Uh, there is a defined amount of, amount of money that I could lose if the trade goes bad. And for me, that's important, not only for peace of mind, but it also permits me to trade something like an iron condor in one of my retirement accounts because the losses are definable. Uh, I can trade it in a retirement account. So it's a defined risk strategy that assumes a stock, uh, an exchange traded fund, or an index is going to remain within a specific price range all the way through to expiration. Now, for the example I'm about to give you, it's going to be on an index, but you can use a credit iron condor on an exchange traded fund or on a stock, really anything that has, that has options. Just take a look at the liquidity of those options because there are several legs involved with this. Uh, in this case, it is a four-legged option strategy that is combining two out-of-the-money credit spreads. Uh, one of those credit spreads is going to be a short call vertical spread that we place above resistance. And the other one is going to be a short put vertical spread that is placed below support. If these are some new terms for you, don't worry, I'm going to be showing you exactly what this looks like when we get, get over to entering the trade. Iron condors are typically created using technical analysis. So usually the starting point for creating an iron condor is a chart. We're going to use that chart in our technical analysis to determine the price range, or we can use a statistical model. We can use a probability model that uses theoretical probabilities or a combination of both. Um, it's my preference that I, I start with a chart and then I consider the, the statistical modeling of it as well. Um, usually I, I like the and or approach where I'm kind of overlaying the two, and you'll see how I do that as well. Index options are often used for iron condors since they're European style. This means they're exercisable only at expiration. Don't confuse being exercisable only at expiration for not being tradable. These are highly liquid. You can trade in, you could trade out provided the market is open. But another thing about them is that they're settled in cash. This means that if things don't go the way that you anticipate and there's going to be an exercise or an assignment, um, there's no shares that change hands. Everything is going to be settled up in cash. And again, I'll walk through some of the finer points of that, but that's the general overview of a credit iron condor. I mentioned earlier that iron condors is one of my favorite option strategies. Well, that doesn't mean that I have the opportunity to use it all the time. Uh, in fact, it's kind of rare that there is a market that is conducive for using an iron condor. Um, and with all strategies, there's not one that's going to be evergreen. There's always pros and cons and different market environments will kind of dictate which option strategy you're going to utilize. It doesn't matter if you like it or don't like it. I'm not a huge fan of buying put options, but when the opportunity arises that I can make some money because the market is going down, well, I'm going to utilize a strategy like buying puts that maybe I don't really love to use, but uh, my goal is to, to generate profits for my account and grow them and to hedge some risk too. So let's talk about the pros and cons of an iron condor. Uh, one of the, the pros is that you could profit if it stays within a range. Now within that range, if it goes up, that's fine. It just can't go up too much. If it goes down, that's fine as long as it stays within the range. Or it can simply go sideways, which is really in line with what the entire strategy was set up as. Uh, it has defined risk, reward, and probability. So I can look at the trade and I can tell you if everything goes horribly wrong, how much I could lose. If everything goes perfectly right, how much I can make. And I can even utilize some of the, the features in Power E-Trade to determine the probability of things going right and of things going wrong. And I'll show you what that looks like when we get to setting up the order ticket. 
I get a cash credit at the onset of the trade. So I see money come into my account, which is great. I like that, but uh, and I can even spend the money if I want. But I don't know if I'm going to keep the money until the end of the trade. So I like seeing the cash credit at the onset. But again, I really don't feel comfortable spending that money or I certainly don't call it a profit until the trade concludes. Uh, iron condors are well suited for a technical. In other words, you're utilizing charts. Your decisions are being driven by the charts and what you're seeing in, in that technical analysis. So well suited for a technical or even a statistical approach to a trade setup. So people that just like to crunch numbers and work off of probabilities and aren't extremely comfortable with charts, well, they can uh, rely on a statistical approach and, and quite a few traders do as well. Another thing is that it will benefit from time decay. See, we know one thing about time, unlike direction and volatility and interest rates, which could go up or down or remain the same, uh, time can't do that. It can only move forward. So we know that we are going to benefit from time decay. You can't go backwards, that's the movies. Now, volatility on the other hand can go up, it can go down. So if it goes up, we call it an expansion. If volatility goes down, we call it a contraction or it can stagnate and say, stay at the same level. In this case, we want to see a volatility contraction or at least we want to see volatility stay at the same level. It's European style, has nothing to do with Europe. It just means that there is no early assignment when you are using an index option. If you are using an American style option, like on a stock or an exchange traded fund, that could have an early assignment. But when you use an index option, like I'm about to use in my example, using SPX or the mini SPX, XSP, these are European style index options. There is no early assignment. Again, don't confuse that with the ability to trade in or out. You can always do that. And then finally, another feature of using an index option is that they have cash settlement. Less complex at expiration because there are no shares to deal with post expiration. Everyone just settles up in cash. You either keep the money that you brought in or trade didn't go so well, so you have to give some of the money back or you have to give all the money back, or you have to give all the money back and then give even more money as well. But it's all settled in cash. No shares trade hands. Let's talk about some of the some of the cons or the downsides. There's limited upside potential. As I mentioned before, the risk is generally greater than the reward. That can be a little bit troubling for beginning traders. They're not used to seeing the loss potential higher than the profit potential. But that's almost always the case when we're doing something like an iron condor. Uh, as I mentioned, it may be one of my favorite strategies, but we really don't see it very often because they tend to appear in transitional environments when maybe we're at the top of a bull market and we're going to stagnate there for a while before we drop, or maybe we're at the bottom of a, a bear market. We're going to stagnate there before we move up. So generally, the market tends to trend and these do not appear when we're seeing the market uh, in a neutral we see it generally at uh, transitional periods of time. There are four legs with an iron condor, and that means you're going to have four times the contract. So if you're used to doing, let's say, a 10 contract position, options position, buying 10 calls, buying 10 puts. In this case, we've got four different legs. That means that maybe a typical trade for you might be 40 contracts. So uh, with more contracts comes more commissions, more fees. So something else to keep in mind with that. They're rather slow to produce returns because the primary driver of them is going to be time decay and a contraction in volatility if you get a contraction in volatility. But it's those two that are the primary driving forces of profitability. So it takes time for you to see that credit uh, remain a credit in your account. And you're using out the money contracts. Out the money contracts generally have less liquidity. Where there's lower liquidity, fewer market participants at those levels, that means there's a larger bid and ask spread, which means once you put an iron condor on, you probably don't want to mess with it very often and close out this side or that side. Now, you may need to do that, but the more that you have to sort of alter the trade or adjust things, the more you're going to suffer from that, uh, that low liquidity environment and the bid ask spreads. Okay, let's take a look at this iron condor order ticket and let's uh, let's define what I've got. First of all, I'm looking to do an iron condor. So on my drop down menu in the upper right hand corner, 
I came down and selected Iron Condor. And I built the Iron Condor, even though the timing of this was, was not great. I wanted to get the slide created. So let me just explain what I did. Uh, I went ahead and took a look at the XSP, which is the S&P 500, symbol SPX. It is the mini SPX index option. So still an index option, but it is one-tenth the size of the SPX. I think one of the things that's important is as you're getting familiar with trading index options and trading more complex strategies like this, you keep your trade tickets as small as possible, and trading a full-size SPX contract is not as small as possible. So going with one contract, and in, in just generally looking at a statistical model, uh, I was looking to trade something that to sell a call or sell a put that had an unlikely probability of being touched. And what I mean by unlikely, I mean pretty unlikely that was going to happen, like upwards of 90% that the market was not going to get to these levels. So looking at a probability model, I went ahead and selected the April 6th 380 put to sell and the April 6th 450. I did this when the XSP was at a level of 417. So by saying that I'm going to sell the 380 put and sell the 450, what I'm really saying is that is the range that I'm selecting and I do not believe it's going to get into that range. Now, if I'm wrong and the market rallies strong or the market comes down hard, I'm, I'm putting a lot of money at risk. Uh, in fact, it could be it could be unlimited risk to the call side. So I'm going to make this a defined risk trade by adding in a long leg. In this case, I am buying the same same expiration, uh, April 6th. I'm buying the 375. That's just five points lower than the put that I'm selling. That 380 put that I am selling brings with it a lot of risk. But if I'm buying, taking some of that credit, and I'm buying the 375, I'm defining the risk of that wing of my iron condor to five points. And I'm doing the same thing with the call wing. If I've sold the 450, uh, that would be a naked call. Well, it's not going to be a naked call because I'm taking some of the credit that I'm getting by selling the 450 call option, and I'm buying the 455. That defines the risk and limits it to $5 there as well. Now, the thing to think about is that when this expires, because this is European style, and when this expires April 6th, the XSP could be up above 450. It could be up above 455. Or it could be down below 375, 380. It could be all the way down there, but it can't be at both places at the same time. Hopefully, it is somewhere in between my short put and somewhere between my short call. So it'll be, hopefully, it will be higher than 380 and lower than 450. And if that's the case, great, the trade went perfectly well. But I have to factor in what if I'm wrong and what if it goes up too much or down too much. So again, it can only be either uh, threatening me to the upside, five points, or threatening me to the downside, downside, five points, but it can't be threatening me on both sides because it's European style, so I do not have $10 of risk. Now, I'm bringing in credits, and I'm also paying out, so I'm paying some debits when I'm buying this call and buying this put for protection. I'm setting the trade up with a limit credit that is at midpoint. In this case, the midpoint uh, is is a buck twenty. Now remember, we're using a index option that has a one hundred multiplier. Doesn't represent a hundred shares because indices do not represent shares. They do not settle up in shares. They settle up in cash. So in this case, I'm doing a limit credit. For a buck twenty, that means the amount that I would receive in this trade, if I could get it ex executed, would be hundred and twenty dollars, excluding commissions. Remember, we're talking about four different legs, one contract per leg, so we're talking about uh, uh, commissions on four four contracts total in this case. Now, I'm not ready to set it up yet. I want to go take a look at the snapshot analysis so I can further drive home some of the points that uh, that this trade I need to make on this so you can understand risk, reward, and probability. So next, let's take a look at the snapshot for this trade before we uh, consider submitting it. Now we're taking a look at the snapshot analysis in Power E Trade, and we're looking at the Iron Condor. Probably now is a little bit more obvious as to why we call it an iron condor. If you take a look at the risk profile on the right-hand side, you can see that it looks like a, a big bird with its wings spread out. Well, we're going to look at that and, and kind of define a couple of the things that you're seeing. 
So on the left-hand side, uh, let's start walking through things. Remember I said that I was using a statistical approach to this where I was selecting out the money puts to sell and out the money calls to sell where they had a high probability of not being uh, touched or not being in the money at expiration. So I used a statistical model and I was looking to build a trade that had about an 80% probability of achieving maximum profit. And I did that by looking at probability of being in the money. So less of a technical approach and more of a statistical approach. So the maximum profit in this case we can see is the credit that I received, of course, less commissions, but that would be 120 and it's giving me a just under 80% probability of, of achieving that. Uh, remember, I also mentioned that the, the risk is generally quite a bit greater than the uh, possible reward, and that's exactly what we're seeing here. Maximum loss of $380 and uh, about 14.53% chance of that happening. Now, remember, I can close this trade down prior to expiration, really any time that the market is open, I can shut the trade down if it's not going my way and hopefully shut it down earlier and maybe capture some of that 120 maximum profit um, and not suffer the maximum of 380 on the loss side. Now, the real, the real thing behind an iron condor that I think is so important, it's the break even. And the break even in this case is 378.80 all the way up to 451.20, giving me about an 81% probability that I'm going to make some money in that. Now, look to the right. This is really what we're, we're focusing on is it'd be great if we could make the full 120, but what is the probability of us making any money at all? Well, it's pretty high. From 378.80 all the way up to 451.20 at expiration, would have us making some profit. Now, if you were to do that mathematically and think about what range I am allowing the S&P to kind of wander across, I'm giving it a 17.5% range over a 29 day period on something that I could close out at any time. So if you look at the trade and say, Sean, I really don't like the fact that I am risking a dollar to make 32 cents, and that is what the risk reward ratio is here. Um, but I need to hold on to this thing for 29 days? No, not at all. You hold on to this as, as long as you're comfortable holding on to it. And I'll be talking about the management of this position shortly here. But there's a couple things also that I want you to understand over the 29 days and how your P&L may be affected by the various components of, of what's going to happen or what may happen in the stock market. And for that, we're going to go ahead and take a look at the Power E-Trade Trade Lab dive in a little bit deeper and talk about uh, various factors in the market and how they affect the P&L. Now I've clicked into Power E-Trade's Trade Lab Risk Metrics, where we're going to go over a couple of those various components I mentioned before. Uh, the first one is going to be price sensitivity. Remember I said that this is a neutral strategy that is not dependent on a directional move for profit. That doesn't mean that the index moving up or down is not going to affect, affect the overall probability of the trade. It most certainly does. In this case, we're looking at the price sensitivity where currently it likes lower prices. For a dollar move, the position is going to, is going to improve by $1. Now we're going to compare that to some of the other components as well. Sensitivity change is going to be the gamma and the gamma in this case, price sensitivity was delta, but sensitivity change is the gamma. And in this case, it's going to grow with lower prices. So if it were to go down a dollar, then we would lose a dollar. If it went down a second dollar, we would lose about a buck 24. Now, the unusual thing about an iron condor is remember, it doesn't want too much downside movement. It, it sort of um, has a cushion there. So if the trade keeps going down, then pretty soon the trade would say, the trade lab would say, likes higher prices. And then if it were to move around and start going higher and higher, after a couple of points, it would say likes lower prices. What it really likes is staying within the range. Uh, the third component is going to be time decay or theta decay, and that's $3.66 per day. Remember, time can only go one way. It doesn't go backwards and it doesn't stagnate. It can only go one way. So in this case, uh, the $3.66 a day is, is pretty much what is going to happen. Volatility, on the other hand, can expand or contract. It can go higher, it could go lower. In this case, as, as we've been talking about, it likes lower implied volatility, $8.23 for a 1% change. So seeing a big contraction in volatility, seeing something like the volatility index, the VIX going from a level of maybe 
25 down to 20. That would be five percentage point change across the overall market. And because this is the S&P 500, the mini, but this is also being uh, looked at with the VIX. So a contraction like that, if you were to say, oh, the VIX went from 25 to 20, how would that benefit the trade? That is a five percentage point contraction in volatility. And for each 1% change, about $8.23. And then the final component is interest rates. It's really not very sensitive to interest rates. It's extremely uh, atypical that we would see the Fed change interest rates by an entire percentage point. Usually it's about 25 basis points or one quarter. So, and it really just doesn't affect the overall trade. So if we're looking at the trade, what are we primarily hoping to see? Well, here's what we're primarily hoping to see a volatility contraction, because that's where we're going to, uh, we're going to see the greatest potential for profit, but an expansion would also be the greatest potential for the loss as well. And then the second one would be that it likes time passing at $3.66 per day. And then of course, the third one currently is going to be the the price changes again we expect to stay in stay in the range but if it begins to head to the upside too much or to the downside too much we're going to need to take action and that's when i'm going to start talking about a little bit of the management of uh, of the iron condor if it begins to move in any one direction uh, or the other or if we see that expansion in volatility which is going to harm the overall p l of the trade Let's assume that we move forward and we place that iron condor on the XSP. Let's go ahead and use the numbers from that example to illustrate a couple of the key points with managing the iron condor. Ideally, at expiration, all four legs are going to expire worthless. And that's going to happen in our example if the price is greater than 380, that's the short put, and less than 450, and that's the short call. In that situation, all four legs will expire worthless and the credit that was in your account, that's the $120, uh, it's gonna remain in your account. The nice thing about that is that your obligation is over. So really you can do with that 120, whatever you like. That's your, your maximum profit. Of course, it's been in the account for a while, but it had that obligation. So you can move forward and utilize the funds as you see fit. Second bullet point, at expiration, if one of the wings' short leg is in the money, uh, let's say that it is less than 380 or greater than 450. And its long leg is out the money. That would mean that it's less than 380, but it's greater than 375. So let's say it's 377. Uh, or it's less than 455, but greater than 450. So in this case, it is, uh, it's gone beyond the short leg, which is a problem but it is not quite exceeded the long leg. So we're not going to be utilizing that. Now, this trade at this point, and by the way, I call this no man's land. That, that's my own term. That's not really an options term, but if it's in this no, man, no man's land point where the short leg, either the put or the call is in the money, but the long leg is still out the money, um, you could have some profit or some loss depending on the exact level. Remember, we're dealing with two break-even points. Uh, one of them is 378.80, and the other one is 451.20. Now, since this is an index option, and it's settled in cash, we don't need to fret so much about an auto assignment on the short leg, um, or the auto exercise on the long leg. We are definitely going to have what would be considered an auto assignment on one of the short legs, if it's either down there in the put territory, or up there in the short short call territory. But it does not involve a transfer of shares in any way, just cash. So let's take, for example, if uh, if the if the position has gone down and it is trading below 380. In fact, I'll use the example I, I gave before. Let's say that it's trading at uh, 377. So it is three points in the money on the put side. And since this is a cash settled instrument, what that really means is that you're going to pay $300 because it's three points in the money. And of that 300, remember 120 was the credit that you brought in. So really going to pay back the 120 and you're going to pay more money. And, and that's the, the loss situation in that case. But because it is European style and settled in cash, this happens uh, at expiration and you just settle up in cash. So it's far less complex 
than if you were to do this on something like an ETF or a stock where you would actually have to deal with shares. Let's hit the third, third bullet point. That's going to be maximum loss. Maximum loss is 380. And this is going to occur at expiration if the price is greater than the long call leg, meaning the price has moved up far more than we thought and it's exceeded that 455. Or if it fell a lot further than we thought and it's gone down lower than our, our long put leg of 375. If that's a situation, then we're simply going to experience maximum loss. You're going to be auto-assigned on the short leg, and then you'll be auto-exercised on the, on the put leg or the call leg, the long side of that iron condor. And basically, you're going to end up losing $380. You're going to give back the 120 and you're going to give back more. That's maximum loss, all settled up in cash, uh, no commissions associated with that. The next bullet point is that iron condors can be treated as really binary positions and they, they can be left alone until expiration. This means that at expiration, you're either going to come out with the maximum gain of 120, the maximum loss of 380, or something in between. Again, we're not dealing with a transference of shares in, in any way. It could be you're going to max gain, max loss, or something in between, depending on, on where we end up. So that's one of the nice things about it as well. I like using iron condors if uh, I'm going to be very busy or if I'm traveling overseas or I'm off-grid, hiking, camping, or something like that. It's nice to know that upon expiration, it's going to be one of three things, max gain, max loss, somewhere in between and as long as there's enough cash in my account to go ahead and handle the maximum loss it all just settles up and then finally as as far as closing it out early you could treat it as binary as i just discussed but if you wanted to close it out early if one side of the iron condor is being threatened and this means that uh the underlying is is moving up more than you thought well now the call side is being threatened or if it's dropping quickly uh, now the put side is going to be threatened but if one side of the iron condor is threatened you can always close out that wing close out the call wing close out the the put wing or if you're just seeing an expansion of volatility uh, under that situation you may just say okay market's getting wild it could really do anything it could move up more than i anticipate or move down than i anticipate i'm just going to go ahead and close down the entire uh, iron condor in that case so again remember that these are liquid and even though they cannot be exercised or assigned until expiration they're a liquid trading vehicle and anytime uh, you start to feel like it's being threatened you can close out the entire position or you can just close out one wing prior to expiration just wanted to cover a few takeaways here as we as we wrap up this video uh, keep in mind that neutral option strategy strategies are best utilized when the markets are not trending um, the markets tend to trend which means that you're not going to have a lot of opportunity to utilize something like an iron condor. And a lot of people will say, oh, I'm going to go out and try to find a stock that isn't going anywhere. Uh, it's sort of stuck in, in a range. Well, I also wouldn't suggest that because a stock that's been stuck in a range for quite some time, not going up, not going down, is going to have very low volatility. And with very low volatility, there's not going to be a lot of premium that you're going to be able to kind of extract from the market. So it really becomes one of these things when the market is uh, stuck and I can't find really good bullish opportunities or bearish opportunities. It becomes almost a fallback strategy. It's one I like. Uh, I like it a lot. I enjoy trading iron condors, but for the most part, it's just not going to be the kind of thing that you can consistently find opportunities in the market. Uh, another thing, just a little bit of housekeeping, you will need to be approved for options level three uh, in order to trade this. And remember, the iron condor is a strategy that you can trade in your retirement account. You'll just want to be sure that all the accounts that you want to trade this kind of strategy are up to level three so that you can do that. Um, and iron condor's profitability does does depend on the price staying contained within a range over a specific amount of time but don't ignore the fact that volatility is something very important um, it's important to understand where the implied volatility is relative to its historical volatility generally we want to see the volatility towards the high range so that we have the opportunity for it to um, contract hopefully revert back to the mean that would benefit the trade 
But also, it's important that you're aware of what's going on with the calendar. Um, you may not want to set up an iron condor as we're leading into earnings season. Earnings season for the S&P is going to create an expansion in volatility, and that's going to hurt the trade. Or possibly something like a Fed meeting or an election, those kinds of things where we anticipate volatility to increase in the market are really going to work against you. So just a couple of takeaways, wanted to mention those, and uh, hopefully it, it gives you kind of a good wrapping on the overall strategy. I hope this video on neutral index option strategies has been both interesting and helpful to you. This video is just one of dozens of educational videos we offer at E-Trade. For a full list of all our educational materials for both investors and traders, please point your browser to etrade.com forward slash education. For the entire content and education team here at E-Trade, thanks for joining us today and all the best to you in your stock market endeavors.